Most people are familiar with, with the concept of scoliosis, a sideways bending of the spine, um, and are frequently familiar, most familiar with uh, the type of scoliosis that develops during adolescence. Uh, however, most people are less familiar with adult degenerative scoliosis or degenerative lumbar scoliosis, which is a, a, a type of scoliosis that develops typically after the age of 50 or so um, in patients who never had uh, necessarily any spinal problems and certainly didn't have scoliosis as a child, uh, but develop it as part of the degenerative processes that, that we're all faced with as we get older. I was 65 when I found out I had scoliosis and I just said okay. And two years later, it, I started with this pain in my back and then one morning, my right leg, I, I couldn't put it on the floor. It just came from out of the blue. And then went from the right to the left. So I started going to the doctors and they said, oh no, you need major surgery. And I said, oh wow, let's think this one over. The most common processes, uh, uh, degenerative processes of the spine that contribute to scoliosis are degenerative disc disease, that is wear and tear disease of the, of the soft tissue cushions between the individual spinal bones, uh, and degeneration of the, the facet joints, which are the joints in the back of the spine. And these two structures, the discs and the facets, allow for normal pain-free movement of the spine, but over time, like any joint in the body, uh, they, can, they can break down and, and degenerate. Uh, if that happens asymmetrically, more on one side than on the other, uh, sometimes because there's a leg length discrepancy, sometimes for no apparent reason, that can start a, a tilt of the spine that starts off at, a, at one area very subtly, but over time can develop into a, into a fairly significant uh, curve of the spine or scoliosis. I woke up one morning where I could not put my right leg on the floor without screaming. I had no idea what it was. All I knew was in terrible pain. And I had this lump, and I didn't know what the lump was. Uh, I came to find out that that was my, sp my spine turned to the left. She was uh, in her early 70s. She'd had an active life, had been active uh, family and, and uh, outdoors activities for a long period of time, but for the two or three years before I met her had had a number of, of symptoms and episodes related to her spine. She'd had a previous spine uh, operation during that time to relieve uh, a foot drop. She'd had a, uh, a neurological deficit and had a, f uh, a laminotomy done by another surgeon and had improvement of her symptoms from that, but continued to deteriorate in other ways. It was so painful that I couldn't sit in a chair and I figured out that the easiest way to exist was to lie on the floor. And I spent my days on the floor with pillows under my neck, a television clicker in one hand and a telephone in the other. So I obtained special x-rays of her entire spine on one film uh, and that showed that she had about a 30 degree scoliosis um, of the degenerative lumbar type. Uh, this in combination with the narrowing around the nerve roots was in my opinion the reason for her, her symptoms which were a combination of back and leg pain. So we performed a surgery, I performed a surgery where I decompressed the nerve roots in her lumbar spine and then placed pedicle screws from the lower thoracic spine down to the sacrum and put fixation into the pelvis as well, connected that with rods and placed bone graft. First time I heard that I needed surgery, I mean major surgery, I was so shocked I didn't believe it. I mean I literally, literally ran out of the doctor's office. I mean, the thought of, uh, you know, rods and screws in my back, I thought it was just a bit drastic. As I'm evaluating a patient, I'm, I'm thinking through a process of what's the smallest operation that I think I can do that has the greatest chance of, of short and long-term benefit for the patient. If, if a decompression alone doesn't seem to be a viable option, then a decompression with a, with a fusion surgery uh, that usually includes instrumentation would be the next option. This can get complicated because then, then we need to determine how many segments of the spine need to be involved in the instrumentation and the fusion. And that's really determined based on the individual patient's symptoms, their posture, 
and their individual scoliosis, because every curve is a little bit different. So if, if an instrumented fusion is appropriate for a patient, we use implants such as these, which are called pedicle screws with a rod construct. And this is basically uh, a screw at each vertebral level that goes down the pedicle of the, of the vertebra and allows us to hold it or manipulate it uh, in space. And then these screws are connected with a small rod to hold that alignment of the spine while a bony fusion forms over time. We don't remove these implants. There's uh, very rarely, if any, reason to take them out. Um, and they're, most of the time we're using implants made out of titanium, which don't react with biological tissues, don't set off metal detectors in the airport, um, and therefore we don't put the patient through another operation to remove them. The entire goal of the surgery is, is functional improvement and reduced pain. Um, and if, if I don't think that I can achieve that for a patient through surgery, then surgery isn't appropriate for that patient. So I, I tell people that after a spinal fusion, they're going to do things differently than they do them before surgery because of the loss of, of, of the spinal movement, but also because they have less pain. And so they often will do things better. They'll be able to walk longer, stand for longer periods of time. Um, and they learn how to, how to pick things up off the floor, how to get in and out of cars differently with their uh, post-fusion spine. The thing is that you spend every day, every day miserable. And uh, you just come to a point where you're so worn down that you give up. In the end, you just say, oh my God, take a leap of faith and let's go with this. The, the, the length of recovery after surgery depends in large part on, on how extensive the operation was. For, for smaller operations that don't involve a fusion, those patients often spend one or two nights in the hospital before going home and within a matter of a few weeks are functioning pretty much as they were before. For the more extensive operations, and certainly for the scoliosis correction surgeries, uh, the, the recovery is, is longer. They'll spend uh, several days, perhaps a week in the hospital. They'll frequently go to an inpatient rehabilitation facility, uh, often for two or three weeks, to work on their mobility. They're not bedridden during this period of time. In fact, we're encouraging them to be out of bed as soon as possible after surgery to start to regain mobility. Um, and I think the entire recovery process probably takes in the range of, of 6 to 12 weeks for, for the, most of these uh, reconstructions, longer for the more extensive ones. My whole life has changed. I have it back. I'm back in the gym. I go five days a week. And uh, I'm in a group with young women that are 40 years old. And I cannot do step aerobics. I can't follow. It's too much for me. And I'm afraid of tripping. So I stay in the corner and I modify everything, but I'm, I'm with them. And I do weights, and when they do push-ups on the floor, I'm against the wall, but I, I can do it.